All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Andy Gold, who is over in New Jersey. How are you doing, Andy? I am fantastic. How about you, John? Oh, absolutely fantastic. And and um, Andy, Andy has, uh, in his time, started three businesses uh, and has worked with over 170 clients, uh, developed urgency-based selling from thousands of, of sales calls, and has now developed boot camps for business owners, presented uh, to many people, does peer presenting to CEO groups since 2009. So um, with a lot of sales background, obviously, Andy, and your urgency-based selling in your first book, Innovate Now, um, one of the things that I think we want to, what we want to talk about today is recurring revenue. We love recurring revenue, right? Recurring revenue is the is the uh, the holy grail of many things. But you're saying there are, there are some dangers to recurring revenue, and that's narcolepsy. <laughs> so, uh, so Andy, in, interesting concept. So, tell me wh why narcolepsy and recurring revenue? Well, uh, uh, just so you know, that's meant to be a a sure. provocative, a provocative statement, right? Um, so the idea of of recurring revenue being narcolepsy is that recurring revenue could put the organization to sleep. Mm -hmm. That's that's the basic idea, and um, like whole organizations, uh, they become structured around recurring revenue, and then they are not ready to change as the market requires them. Um, particularly uh, with unknown black swan events ahead of us. Right. So like we've had uh, you know, just in the last 30, 40 years, I think there was the Reagan recession in 82, the SNL crisis that went from 89 to 91 and cost, you know, cost the, ver the first George Bush his reelection, the uh, dot-com bust in 2000, the uh, CMO meltdown, in 2007, collateralized mortgage obligations, yeah. the uh, you know COVID in 2020, these are systemic black swan events that probably affected almost everybody. On top of which, mm -hmm. there are you know like regional or or segment black swan events. For instance, um, you know not everybody predicted that Donald Trump would become president in 2016, mm -hmm. or that he would start a tariff war with China, which really affected a lot of companies that imported um, products from China. So that's ex an example of a black swan event, you know, an unpredictable right. event. Anyway, how do we respond? How is an organization setting up to respond to future black swan events? Yeah, because um, um, just uh, Andy there, just what, what you said there, I mean, these are, these events tend to, or are definitely a, seem to occur every couple of years they seem to be getting even you know faster now you know we had uh, obviously 9 11 and the financial crisis and then we had COVID, etc now we have recessionary uh and i guess when you have a lot of recurring revenue and long-term customers it's very easy to get complacent and then to be kind of shocked when those say there's an economic downturn right now and some of these companies have to do cutbacks and suddenly your your uh your contract is on the table for slashing. I mean, these things. And then you're suddenly going, shoot, I got to go out and find new business. That's it. That's it. A hundred percent. And, and so the, you know, the, there's a paradox here. The paradox mm -hmm. is that what defines a successful business very often is recurring revenue, mm -hmm. but that has the seeds of its own destruction because it dulls entrepreneurial preparedness. Mm hmm. And, and I come from the perspective of, you know, for most of my experience, I've had to create 50% of my sales every year. Right. And, and I think companies that are in that place have a greater sense of entrepreneurial readiness than companies where the typical salesperson, 70 to 90% of their business is recurring revenue. And then the leadership or ownership says, hey, could you just go out, you know, 10 to 30% of the time? And do some prospecting. Well, the problem is the habit, the mindset, the habit is to be in the mindset of doing recurring revenue. Mm -hmm. And to the extent 
that salespeople go out with a mindset of recurring revenue and they even try to do business development, it's a train wreck. Right. They're unprepared. Mm-hmm. So if if you're not doing, I'm using this as a cutoff point, yeah. at least 50% business development, how does an organization prepare itself when it's it's driven by recurring revenue, which is a very good thing? Mm-hmm. So that's the thoughtfulness here. How do you prepare for the black swan events that are inevitably going to occur? Yeah. And that's what you know. We wanted to talk about a little bit. What can an organization do? Yeah, I think one of the things, Andy, I think also trap people fall into with recurring revenue is it, that kind of thing is uh, no news is good news, right? I haven't heard anything from that customer. They're you know re-up last year. Everything looks fine. Therefore, I can I can focus elsewhere. And I think that's another trap people fall into where they don't really stay on top of the of their accounts, particularly if they've been around a while and they're not really tracking what's going on and therefore they're allowing themselves to be surprised when a surprise comes. Yeah, I would say that you know, my first business was born with thinking I had recurring revenue and um, it was a sales agency selling packaging. Mm-hmm. And within a few months, I lost 80% of the sales on which I was depending. And Mm -hmm. as a result, not really knowing how to sell back then, this is, you know, a long time ago, like the time of Noah's Ark, Mm -hmm. I had to develop all these entrepreneurial skills. And then later on, I had a 10-year run where when I was in that 10-year run, it looked like forever. This was predictable. It was, And then um, two of my major clients went into Mm self-manufacture. And when they did that, we lost all the business. So... um, this this theme was really born out of personal experience. I've seen it within my clients' businesses. And so what I wanted to offer your audience is, what can you do to either reinforce your entrepreneurial uh, preparedness? Mm-hmm. Or if you're not really prepared, what could you start doing tomorrow right. to become entrepreneurially, entrepreneurially prepared for the for the next black swan event yeah so i would say um, um, part of it obviously andy as you know i mean it's all about you know where what is it that tony robbins says you know where attention goes energy flows so i guess the first part is that you have to make a conscious decision like you said earlier is to say i'm going to do like 50 percent or dedicate 50 percent of my time to business development right as opposed to maintaining current customers but i think a lot of it has to start with a conscious decision right absolutely there has to be alignment from the top Mm -hmm. and it 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 can't be an option because me included most people you know are not thrilled with change and if you say look Here's, a, here's if, if we say to the sales team and to sales leadership, listen, we think it would be a really great idea if you were entrepreneurially prepared, um, but there were no, there was no must have here. Mm-hmm. I, I think that the uptake would probably be zero. You know, people right. would continue doing um, what they're doing. So there has to be strong support from the top. Uh, and you could start some with some some exercises that are not so difficult which I think can revolutionize and transform an entire organization. And, you know, that's part of what I wanted to share with your audience. Well, let's, well, let's get into that because um, like I said, I mean, I don't think, especially if you have spent a long time and you've the good times and you've had a lot of recurring revenue and that sort of starting then to shift your mindset back into business development, that that can uh, sometimes that muscle memory isn't quite as good as it used to be. Exactly, exactly. So core ideas in urgency-based selling, my selling system, Mm -hmm. bold vision, bold behavior, supported by risk mitigation uh, techniques. So bold vision, bold behavior to open a new opportunity, Mm -hmm. and then risk mitigation techniques to deal with skepticism and risk aversion. Okay, so how could a company which not is not doing this at all or not follow uh, firing on all cylinders. What are some easy ways that you could get started if you're not doing this? Mm-hmm. Well, how about weekly bold behavior drills? What was the boldest thing you did in the last week? So this is when, when we do sales yeah. training, this is like a classic weekly 
um, a drill uh, to encourage and reinforce and celebrate bold behavior. And, you know, I, I've done this with CEO groups where I ask, you know, what's the boldest things you've done in the last week or two? And people are scratching their heads and they're thinking about it. Uh, the owners, uh, what that says is they're not focused on it. As you yeah. were pointing out, there has to be a focus. So mm -hmm. just imagine for a moment if you got a sales team of five to 10 team members and every week you have a drill where you talk about what was your boldest behavior this week. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the beginning, it might be, well, I picked up the phone and I called an existing customer. You know, like pe people may have to do some calisthenics sure. first. Yeah, yeah. They do wild and crazy, right? <laughs> right? No, 100%. But, but this could become a method to transform an entire culture, an entire organization. I mean, this is an exercise that could be taken to each operating department in an organization. Mm -hmm. But now uh, you got to uh, have some stand. I'm sorry. Go ahead. You know, I was going to say to your point, uh, Andy, like even to do it within this, the sales organization, that requires the the sales manager to, uh, you know, to be a coach and, and to absolutely. really be on top of that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So it could take some coaching of the entire organization. Um, again, you know, folks don't, don't really like to change and there needs to be strong motivation. So part of the motivation is preparation against the black swan event. Mm -hmm. The other part is how do we motivate a salesperson? There are many owners and executives who think it's commission, it's compensation. You know, my view right or wrong is that just makes it fair. Yeah. But what really motivates folks is that the system generates respect and self-respect. Mm -hmm. So self-respect comes from a bold, a bold vision. We're going to, you know, imagine in your mind's eye, uh, two mountaintops, one yeah. lower than the other. So the prospects on the lower mountaintop and, and we could take them to the higher mountaintop. Mm -hmm. we, we could take them to a higher mountain of well-being. So um, what is that? We need to be focused on that as the bold vision. And that gives us self-respect. And then when our selling system is strong enough, we get respect from the buyer. Right. In, in our system, we call them PIKs, payments in kind. It's what the buyer does to show that he or she is, is engaged and serious. Could be fill out a, a credit yeah. application, um, a buyer introducing you to the CEO or to the team tour my plant, they come and tour your plant, they check a reference. All these are examples of PIKs. Mm -hmm. And as asks, as a, as a salesperson asking a buyer, these could all be bold behaviors. Yeah, yeah. These could all be bold behaviors, but we have to earn the right to them. Yeah. So uh, there's earning the right with the bold vision and then the bold behavior. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, 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 no. Cause I just wanted to pick up on that, what you just said there, because, um, that's a trap I think a lot of people fall into that idea of, well, I'm engaged with the prospect. We're having conversations, you know, everything's moving forward. We have another conversation next week. And, but to your point, they haven't done anything yet. They've agreed to conversations. And uh, then if there's a two week gap between conversations, they're not doing anything. They're not engaged in the process at all. Uh, uh, to your point, as you made earlier, unless they are doing something to show engagement and you are actively engage, um, actively, you know, is, is soliciting them to take certain actions, nothing's moving there, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Quick, quick story. Yep. I was once sitting with a, um, a VP of sales and looking at the call reports in the CRM from a salesperson who was calling on um, a prospect who could buy from the salesperson, the consumable, the salesperson sold on every call. And, you know, we look at this, at these, at these call reports, you know, met with the buyer, great meeting, no needs met with the, you know, three weeks later, mm -hmm. met with the buyer, great meeting toward the plant, no needs, uh, you know, great net three weeks later, uh, met with the buyer, great meeting, went to lunch, no needs. And, you know, we could have sold them every time we visited. And so what we ultimately did, the bold behavior is we we we, we nudged the salesperson to go to the owner of the business. Right. When he called the owner reluctantly and, you know, the owner, uh, the, uh, the, the screener uh, sh shuffled them off to the uh, 
uh, to the to the buyer mm-hmm. when, when he realized that it was a salesperson of this consumable and the the um, the buyer comes on the phone stoking mad. You're going around me. Right. You want to know why I'm not buying from you? Your pricing's too high. Your quality is terrible and your service stinks. Right. So here was a situation where uh, the salesperson continued to call. What was going on? Well, the salesperson had to write down that he was making sales calls. The buyer mm-hmm. had to write down a report that he was seeing um, salespeople and we were going bankrupt at $250 yeah. a call. So <laughs> this would be a classic situation for bold behavior. And when you install a program like urgency based selling, which mm-hmm. generates respect and self respect, which focuses on bold vision, bold behavior, you, 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 you could do. Um, you could do business development with a salesperson only doing it 10 to 20% of the time. Two of the other exercises I'll briefly mention. Yep. So one of them is weekly bold behavior drills. Mm-hmm. Um, bring us home a couple of testimonial letters. That's yeah. another thing that will start a change process. And then finally, if you're in particularly a B2B business where warm introductions are possible, when was the last time you asked for a warm introduction from a raving big fan? Mm-hmm. So these are all things that can be done to start that change to bold vision, bold behavior. And when you do them, the last thing I would add is you got to do them on a do or die basis. Right. So what does that mean? Let's say that we set a standard for the sales team that they're going to bring in warm, one warm introduction every month. And let's say you know, we've come to the end of the month mm-hmm. and we're having an accountability meeting. We're sitting down, we're talking about a lot of things. And we say to the salesperson, gee, h- how did it go last month? Did you get any warm introductions? No, not, ne- no, I didn't boss, but uh, I'm going to try twice as hard in month two. So now here's a quick math question. In month two, how many warm introductions does that salesperson need to get? Believe it or not, many salespeople think one, <laughs> but oh, it's, no, it's, it's two. two. It's two. Yeah. But yeah. but if they do, if we do it on a best efforts basis, a salesperson could collect uh, 12 zeros. Yeah. So an important part of a change program is what we call this do or die element. Mm-hmm. And and then you just you you touched on the, the testimonial thing there, but also the referral mm-hmm. thing because I think that's that still continues to be something that let's face it, most people aren't very good at. And normally when you uh, you know say to a team, oh, you, you know, are you looking for referrals? They just shoot off an email. Hey, Andy, do you know anybody else who could use our service? And you go, um, not right now. And they go, okay. So yeah, I looked for referrals, nothing, nothing came of it. I mean, seriously, when sometimes you reach out and you expect somebody to immediately have that profile of customer at the top of mind for you to immediately hand off, you have got to do a little more work than that. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, when we coach on this, um, we combine two things, the magic moment of access, which I'll describe, mm-hmm. and, and you know, linking in with your big fan and lo- finding who do you want to meet where you, know, you can look at the first connections on yeah. LinkedIn. So the magic moment of access is when you're talking to a prospect or, or client rather, and they tell you they love you. You just did a great job. You, you know, you took care of their needs mm-hmm. and they're happy and they don't have any needs. And that's a moment where you could ask for, hey, do you know Joe or Jane at ABC Company well enough to make an introduction? So you don't just ask them, who do you know? You come with people that hopefully you know, they know that you want to meet. And so that would be another great way to begin right. transforming, um, uh, the, you know, the sales team and improving entrepreneurial readiness against the next black swan event. Yeah. And, and in your example, there is uh, stop pushing all the work onto your customer. <laughs> I mean, especially that case, like, can you find me a referral? You go figure it out. I'm not going to do anything here. I'm just going to ask. <laughs> Good point. And, and, and just to, to piggyback on your comment, you should write the introduction mm-hmm. if, and, and hopefully they'll do an email introduction and CC you yeah. and, and you, and you should write it for them. So there are a lot of things that we could do right now. You know, a salesperson says, hey, I don't have time to do it. I'm spending 80, 90 percent of my time. I don't have time for cold calling. OK, but do you have magic moments of access? You say you have great relationships. Mm-hmm. Do you have magic moments? What do you do in the magic moment? Yeah, no, I think that's it. I think that's an excellent point, Andy, because I mean, there's always that there's always that complaint about, oh, I'm busier than I've ever been in my life, you know, and and I always say 
are we though really or are we just more distracted than we've ever been and i think there's plenty of time in your day if you go if you bother go look for it and find Absolutely. out how many different things are you doing in days that are sucking up and just wasting time right right so i think there are lot there's lots of stuff that organizations can do right now to improve entrepreneurial readiness mm -hmm. and um to avoid narcolepsy from recurring revenue <laughs> Because yeah. we never know when it's going to hit, right? We never yeah. know when the next Black Swan event's going to hit. Yeah, yeah, and we can't say, uh, and and we can't continue to be just surprised. Oh, this is something I, I wasn't expecting. This no, you've got to be prepared for because it's happening on a more regular basis. And 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 I think uh, who who is it? I think it was the head of IBM. Was it once upon a time who said he and they were when they market dominant position. He said he always at the end of every day he worried about who was going to take them out there was nobody on the there was nobody on the horizon but that's where he spent his time figuring out like what could happen well i know that that i think uh, bill gates used to think about that in fact he once i'm not saying ibm didn't but i i'm pretty sure i once read that bill gates he wrote a memo about all his concerns and somehow it got out and and it was just theoretical and i think microsoft's uh, stock price dropped ten percent the next day when again, but it was all, you yeah. know, just hypothetical worst case scenarios. Absolutely. Well, listen, thanks very much, Andy. Uh, and before we go, Andy, uh, all of Andy's information will obviously below be below here, and Andy's been a regular guest here. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do. Yeah. Well, um, urgency based selling. I've kind of alluded to some of it. Urgency based selling. Is is mostly about cultural shift, sales cultural shift, and we 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 focus on the salesperson as a hero, to align them with reasonable corporate goals, and to help make both the sales team and the organization more entrepreneurial. So um, we have a number of different programs, including, you know, kind of like a starter program of eight to ten sessions. And um, but we could do you like, you know, an annual sales meeting. We could, you know, give a presentation. Right. But basically, we've designed a, a process, a standard sales call, a step by step procedure, which we teach to sales teams. And that's, you know, to help for a one call close. Mm -hmm. And then we have what's called a battle plan to stitch together a series of calls in a campaign. And we do these, you know, we do these just for about any kind of business it's pretty much the same program. We customize it, we tailor it, but it's the same basic program adjusted to the facts on the ground for any um, you know particular business. Yeah, well, fantastic. Well, I would encourage people to go check it out. I think it's always good for you to be looking at your sales, your sales process, you know, how you're approaching things, making sure it's still entrepreneurial. And just one last comment, Andy. I remember after the soon after the financial crash you know when i was when i was running hothway and we we're doing spins doing some spin selling implementation somewhere and and i think i had a meeting in singapore with the head of some company and he was lamenting to me he said oh you know my sales team was so great you know now they're really really struggling i don't know what's going on and i said well were they great though and he goes what do you mean and i said but they were selling in a hot market when everybody had budget and stuff you know so i said so maybe maybe they were great at making connections maybe they were great order takers or whatever it doesn't necessarily mean they were great salespeople. i said now you're going to discover who's really good you know that's a, a great final point that the the very competent strong salespeople, um they hit numbers in all markets yeah. you know i'm not saying they're going to do as well in a recession mm -hmm. as yeah. in a boom time but they go out and they find new business. So it's a great point you're making. Yeah. All right. Well, listen, thanks again, Andy. Thank you for watching and listening. I'll see you all again soon. Thank you. Thanks so much. Have a great day. Bye, everybody. Yeah.